I said, where's the, how about? So I come here, great. No way. Ah, okay. okay. Great. So I said, here, okay. Yeah. I cannot see that. Can I put it on my lap? Yeah. I will be able to put it on my lap. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, but when, it, when the time comes. Just take a moment to make sure that everyone is seated. That's great. So, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the RSA. I am Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation and Development here at the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today for today's special event. Before we kick off properly, can I ask you to put your mobile phones onto silent? Please be active on Twitter. Um, we have two hashtags for your delectation today. So you can have RSA mission or UCL mission because this is a collaboration between ourselves, UCL, and sp supported by Innovate UK. Now, as the hashtag suggests, Today's event marks the launch of a new collaboration that we're very excited about between the RSA and UCL's new Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And we're working together to develop mission oriented innovation policy in practice. Now, a guiding light of this project has been Mariana Mazzucatu, Professor Mariana Mazzucatu, um, who is the thought leader behind the concept of the entrepreneurial state. And I'm delighted she's joined us here today as we begin to open up a public conversation about the role of policymakers in setting the direction for economic growth and how that will be critical to helping us tackle the many and complex global challenges that we currently face, everything from climate change to the UN's sustainable development goals. Mariana is about to take up the role of professor in the Institute of Innovation and Public, um, Innovation and Public Value at UCL, which is a brand new institute at the Bartlett, and she is the founding director of IIPP. Alongside uh, Mariana, we have a stellar cast. We're delighted by, to have be joined by two highly distinguished and influential economists. We have Geoffrey Sachs, who is Professor of Sustainable Development and Director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and Carlotta Perez, Professor of Technology and Development at the London School of Economics. Geoffrey is an internationally renowned Professor of Economics, leader in sustainable development, and a senior UN advisor. He's been twice named among Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential world, world Leaders, and he was called by the New York Times probably the most important economist in the world. So we are in esteemed company. <laughs> Got to live up to that, Jeff. Um, <laughs> he is Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the Sustainable Development Goals and previously advised both Ban Ki-moon and Kofi Annan on the Millennium Development Goals. Carlotta is a researcher, lecturer and international consultant. She's visiting professor, as we say, at LSC, but also professor of technology and development at the TUT in, in Estonia, uh, honorary professor at the University of Sussex and academic in residence for Anthemis. She specialises in the social and economic impacts of technical change and is author of the influential technological re re revolutions and financial capital, the dynamics of bubbles and golden ages. Her current research focuses on the historical roles of the state and civil society in shaping innovation. So as you can say, this stage is positively groaning with the weight of expertise, so I am going to shut up. So after we, we're going to have short presentations from each of those, and after we hear from them, we'll have a section where we open up to questions, and I'm sure you have burning things that you want to ask. So we're going to move on quickly, because to get all of that in in one hour is quite a challenge in its own right, and I am mission orientated. So I'm going to hand over to Mariana to kick us off. 12 minutes, and I actually have a timer. I'll time them as well. Uh, um, and what I want to do is tell you a bit about the project itself, but I kind of want to get to that at the end. And I want to start off with really the provocation, which is that today there's lots of talk about these kind of grand challenges, whether it's around climate change or the healthcare crisis or inequality, which is probably the biggest crisis, right? So challenges that society must face. But we really have very little understanding, if you want, of the role of public policy in that space. And one of the points of the project is really to reinvigorate the notion of public institutions that are actually able to dream and have visions and actually think in a grand way about grand challenges. And what I mean by a limited way is that, unfortunately, Keynes was right when he said that you know, practitioners on the ground are actually slaves of defunct economic theory. And the kind of defunct economic theory, I think, that we're in some ways tackling here is this notion that you only need public policy to come in to fix a problem. So economists, we're very smart. We have our wonderful mathematical formulas. And we actually theorize this in terms of fixing market failures. 
And actually, if you look at the past, and I think Carlotta will give us quite a few historical examples of this, when we've actually had transformational and structural change in the last 200 years of capitalism, because don't forget that feudalism was 500 years of inertia, right? So lots of change under capitalism. That kind of transformational change was often accompanied by bold and ambitious public policies, which were not just fixing problems, they were not fixing markets, they were actively shaping and co-creating markets. And that really is a completely different mindset. It also is a different level of energy inside public institutions. It's a different justification for what they're for, but also it should, uh, if it works properly, trickle down into things like different ways that we assess these organizations. Um, but first, let me just say, I mean, I kind of do a lot of thinking around innovation, and innovation really as an area, and we shouldn't forget that innovation is not just technological, it's social and institutional, but even just think of the big technological changes that have occurred, in fact, over the last 200 years, what's striking is, in fact, there were these, if you want, mission-oriented, market-shaping, market-creating strategies, but they're often not very understood. So the whole point of this book that I wrote that's now kind of old and I'm bored of it, so I'll just quickly say what it was about, was to look at how these major technological changes that have occurred under capitalism were in fact often driven by these mission-oriented organizations, whether it was the DARPA kind of organization that uh, you know, funded the internet, or even the Navy, which was very important for GPS, or unfortunately, the CIA, which was quite important for touchscreen. Think about that next time you put your finger on your screens. Um, but also, you know, in terms of, say, public banks that today are in many ways leading, at least on the financial side, uh, the uh, investments around renewable energy. And it's very hard, in fact, if just looking at renewable energy itself, which is not enough when we think about green, right? Green is actually a whole direction potentially for the whole economy, but even just with renewable energy, solar, wind, uh, marine, but also other forms of energy like fracking and nuclear all actually uh, trace their uh, fundamental financing back to different types of public organizations. Now, once we admit this, then a the question becomes, wait, hold on, for each one of those successes, for each internet, there was probably lots of failures. For each uh, uh, you know, solar innovation, or say ARPA-E's latest uh, big innovation around uh, battery storage, uh, storage, there's probably lots of failures as well. So at the organizational level, what do we actually know that was important for these particular organizations, and again, I would include their public banks, I'll mention one particular one in a minute, for you know, what was important for their ability to actually welcome that risk-taking, welcome that explorative process. How did they actually become, or did they become, learning organizations? Because one of the real problems is that when we dismiss the role of the public sector, as simply facilitating, administering, regulating, kind of spending, fixing problems, and not actually being one of the engines of growth, we don't then actually think about key questions that business schools ask themselves about thinking out of the box, you know, rejuvenating the mature corporation, because the private sector also, just like the public sector, often when it gets too big, might become a bit inertial. Because we've dismissed the role of the public sector as just being, in some ways, a cheerleader leveling the playing field, you know, getting the taxation system right, getting the regulation system right, fixing the problems, then we actually haven't gotten our hands dirty or nails dirty in understanding at the organizational level what actually mattered in DARPA's organization. Why is it that some public banks, say like the KFW in Germany, has actually been mission-oriented, has actually also attracted some pretty hefty weight economists even want to think about their investments versus some other public banks in the world. And I'm thinking of, of one particular in Italy where I'm from, but also uh, India's own history of public banking isn't as stellar as some other countries. What went wrong in some public banks? Um, and that sort of organizational element is one of the key features of this project that we're going to be collaborating with, with the RSA, which is actually to get some sharing between organizations around their challenges, but also the opportunities for thinking in this mission-oriented way. And this is very important today when, after the financial crisis, industrial policy has come back, innovation policy has come back because countries are sort of starving for investment-led growth and innovation-led growth and not personal debt uh, consumption-led growth. 
as well as trying to rebalance economies away from finance towards the real economy. But one of the sort of lazy then uh, outcomes of that, of that opportunity, has been to go back to thinking this is just about making a list of sectors, right? So we want aerospace, the creative industries, financial services, uh, life sciences, right, to be where we're going to sort of show our strong competence. And this mission-oriented thinking, what it's trying to do is say, hold on, just step back a minute, and why don't we think of industrial strategy and innovation policy as sort of challenge-led, mission-led, and actually think of it literally in terms of things like the Moonshot program, right, so the Apollo program, to get to the moon, that was a concrete problem, right, it wasn't just, you know, space exploration, it was a concrete problem, when they got there, they knew they got there. Some people say they never did, but we won't get into the whole conspiracy thing, right? But what that actually did by having what this... Trump think about yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you working for him? No. <laughs> no. Um, no. I'm, um, I'm, I'm fleeing from him, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, what that required was a sort of dynamic and catalytical new type of thinking across many different sectors not just you know, the obvious ones to get to the moon, aerospace and robotics, even clothing, right? You couldn't just go to the moon in, in t-shirts and shorts. So what's very interesting is if we think today about sort of the climate change mission or even care, care and health care as providing, if you want, a guiding light for what the new missions might be of the future, actually understanding this as intersectoral and thinking out of the box for different types of organizations that are, again, mission-oriented, which might be seen as sort of top-down, but fostering lots of bottom-up exploration and experimentation across different types of organizations, public, private, but increasingly the third sector, to tackle these problems. Um, and, uh, and what um, I just want to finish off with sort of four key questions that the project is going to be focusing on with these different organizations that we're inviting to take part of our collaboration. And the first is sort of, you know, what does it mean to actually admit that economic growth and innovation have not just a rate, but also a direction? What does it mean to openly, in your own organization, talk about this directionality of change? How has it been done, literally by looking at different types of mission statements, but how has it been somewhere between a grand challenge and also specific around you know, problems that might have required particular types of technologies. Second, this issue about how have uh, particular types of organizations uh, thought about increasing their own organizational competence and capacity, and again, this welcoming of risk and exploration. So this organizational learning organization sort of dynamic, how has that occurred? Has it occurred explicitly or not? Third, assessment. How have organizations, whether again it's DARPA, the KFW, CITRA, uh, a big innovation agency in Finland that has been very important, uh, the BBC in the UK, very mission oriented, how have they both assessed themselves, but also how have they been assessed in terms of their economic value? Okay, anyone living in the UK will know that in the last uh, two years, the BBC has gone uh, through a charter review, both Brian Eno and I, who's sitting here in the front audience, were at a very interesting panel, fun panel, where you talked about prisons half the time, I remember. Um, anyway, uh, around that charter review, and what was really striking to me about that was that the BBC, being a classic mission-oriented organization, then was evaluated in terms of, literally, you know, what it had done by the government, but also all these you know, fancy economists behind that, as though all it had done was actually fix some sort of market failure. So what it was told to do was go back and fix that market failure, and in that case it was the public good problem. So create you know, high quality news, great documentaries about giraffes in Africa, but why are you doing soap operas? Why are you doing talk shows? Right? So there was no actual measure of real public value and social value in the measurement of what the BBC actually has done since basically since its foundation, but also if you think of the 1980s and its learning program, which led to the BBC Micra, a technological innovation, and all the spin-outs that came from that, ACORN and, um, and ARM, but especially its transmission of public and social value, we actually didn't have a way to capture that. Right? So this issue of assessment really matters. And in the public banking world, if anyone knows anything about it, they're constantly accused of crowding out the private banking sector in the same way that the BBC was accused of crowding out uh, the private broadcasters. Now this is not to say crowding out doesn't occur, but the problem is we need dynamic metrics to actually capture mission-oriented market-making 
and market shaping. Otherwise, the few organizations that even try are told to stop. And lastly, you know, this is not just about you know, taking big risks and doing big things. It's also about creating a more sustainable, inclusive, and smart society. But that word inclusive is really important. And looking across organizations in the world, including, say, Yasma in Israel, which has been very important in terms of its own public venture capital fund leading to its reputation of startup nation, how have they thought about the new types of contracts, the new types of deals, the concrete mechanisms that actually will allow not just risks to be socialized, but also the rewards, so that we finally get smart innovation-led growth that is also inclusive growth? That's what the project's going to be about. Now, you've set a benchmark for being extraordinarily on time. Um, your slides will emerge as, as soon as you begin to talk. So we're now going to hand over to um, Carlotta, who is going to zero in, and there will be slides momentarily, um, on, there we go, on, on the environment and why the environment is not a problem, but it's the solution. Exactly. I imagine you're all asking yourselves the solution to what? <laughs> well, the solution to not enough jobs, the solution to not enough investment, the solution to the whole inequality issue, not enough growth. That's a big, big tall order. So I'm going to explain how I came to such a conclusion. And I'm going to say a little more, which is another conclusion, which is that we are now, I'm going to share with you an interpretation of the current moment, that we are now in the equivalent of the 1930s. Now, that sounds like pretty bad news, and of course it is. It's a time when there wasn't enough investment, when finance wasn't doing its job, when government was not doing its job except poor Franklin Delano Roosevelt trying very hard, or Hitler, because that's the whole thing too. We get, we get populism, we get people that are desperate in times like the 30s, like today. So, uh, to think that we are in the 1930s sounds really bad. But it's also good. Now, could, how could we think that it's good? Well, because after the 1930s came the post-war boom after a horrendous war, of course, but that's not necessary. It hasn't been necessary in history. The thing is that this whole idea that I'm going to share with you is based on many decades of work on understanding technological revolutions and how they evolve. So, we are now in the fifth technological revolution. There have been five, the first one was the Industrial Revolution, of course. Then came the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways. Then after that, we had the age of steel and heavy engineering. That was the first globalization. That meant actually turning the Southern Hemisphere with the counter-seasonal agricultural possibilities to send up with steamships and having the whole infrastructure build up so that you could have a global economy and global prices even, and of course also any other materials. There were transoceanic uh, telegraph, transcontinental railways. I mean, it was really a big globalization equivalent to now, and there is a lot to learn from that one. Then we had, of course, the age of the automobile, mass production, oil, petrochemicals, and so on. And finally, we have now our own age, our own information technology age. That's not a mistake. It's only halfway through. There's, we have only lived half of this, the bad half. The half when you have all the inequality, all the creative destruction, all the terrible things when capitalism is at its most callous. And we could have in front a better time, which is what I will try to say. So what each one of these technologies, these revolutions do, is to lead to a techno-economic and a social institutional shift. We actually get different 
ways of organizing society each time, which correspond to what can be done with that particular technological revolution. We won't have time to discuss such details, but trust me. <laughs> so, what they do is that they bring new directions for innovation and a quantum jump, a quantum leap in productivity, not just for some of the industries, but quite, for quite a bit. And that makes a big difference. That allows society to have greater wealth. The problem is, does it only do that and only for one destructive area, or does it do it in a much wider sense? Now, what we have to, how we can learn about this is by looking at the regularities in these revolutions and how they evolve. Now, the historical record is going to show, you, show us a regular pattern of propagation where we have installation periods, which is what we just have had, turning point, which is where we are now, and a deployment period, which have been the golden ages. So if we put them all in a row, we have a bubble prosperity, then we have this turning point, recession, depression, which can be very short or very long, depending on circumstances. And then we have golden ages. So the first one was canal mania, then canal panic. And after that, we had the Great British Leap. Then we have railway mania, then railway panic. And after that, after the great exhibition uh, in the Crystal Palace, we have the Victorian boom. Then on the third, we had the whole transport global infrastructure buildup, which was funded mainly from the city of London. And then we had a lot of, uh, of collapses all over the place, the bearing crisis in Argentina, also Australia, New Zealand, every, including the USA, which were all sort of developing countries at the time. And then we have the Belle Epoque in Europe and the Progressive Era in the US. After that, the next revolution was mass production, so we had the Roaring Twenties, automobiles, electricity, etc. And then we had a very, very long turning point, much longer than any before, precisely, I think, because of the resistance of business to having a proper government-led thing, which they accepted very well after the war because they discovered it was wonderful to collaborate with government, but it was a bit late for all the suffering. So anyway, then we got the golden age, the post-war boom. And now we have already had two collapses, two big bubbles and two collapses after the whole Nasdaq boom and, and, the, um, and the whole global, the global bubbles all over the place. So where are we now? We are in the same as the 1930s and we could have ahead a sustainable global golden age. That's what I think and that's what I would like to argue. Mm. So one very important thing to know is that increasing inequality is one of the features that distinguishes installation from deployment. So installation, which is the finance-led period and the creative destruction period, brings a lot of inequality. This is the, one of the Piketty and size um, graphs where you can see how in the Roaring Twenties and during the 1930s, you have 25%, up to 25% of income goes to the top 1% in the US. You have the exact same thing now in the, uh, after the, you know, the 80s, the stagflation of the 80s, then the Nasdaq bubble, then the, the 2000s bubble. We have also 25%. You can see how the 1% gathers the whole thing. Of course, there is all this inequality. And then you notice that in the post-war boom, that 25% came to, down to 10% of a much bigger pie because we had a lot of growth at the time. So what does that represent? Well, if we put them there, that's the installation period, the turning point. Then we have the deployment period, which is the golden age, the next installation again. So capitalism seems to have these swings where you have inequality and re-equality if the government acts. So when positive sum gain policies are applied at the turning point, growth resumes, jobs multiply, and inequality decreases. Now, what's the other thing that distinguishes um, 
installation from deployment. It is that installation destroys jobs. It's because the technological revolution, when it does a leap in productivity, by definition it means that it's going to reduce the amount of people necessary to make what used to be made and the, some of the new things that are made. However, up to now, there have been other jobs that are not destroyed, that are actually created, unimagined jobs. And looking at history, we discover that they are actually associated to a new style of life, a new way of living. And that's what happened in the US in the uh, post-war boom. There again, you have the first bit is the 1920s. Then we have the great part, which is the 1930s. And then we look at how manufacturing jobs grow by only 25, 30%, whereas the jobs in retail, trade, government, um, services of all sorts, finance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, grow five times. So, in fact, it was the way of life, the home ownership, the consumerism, the creation of a suburban, uh, the suburban landscape, which meant lots of shopping centers and all sorts of things, that created the new jobs, not the mass production, which was reducing jobs both in manufacturing and in agriculture. So, the problem is that to get there, government has to give a clear direction for innovation and investment. Why do we need a clear direction? What is it for? Well, every technological revolution brings an enormous range of possibilities. But the thing is that any of them could be wonderful if everybody followed it. But if they scatter, there's no guarantee. So what you need is to find a converging direction so that you can get synergy, which means suppliers, skills, distributing networks, knowledge, all sorts of things that go in a similar direction. So it's not really picking winners, it's picking a winning direction that's converging for all. And it also requires demand. So you have to have dynamic demand so that you can profitably follow that direction. So it does two things, it gives synergy and it, gives, and it provides demand. That's what direction means. Now, what have we had as directions before? In the first one, which was the Napoleonic Wars, when we had the deployment period in Britain, which was the only one that was doing the revolution, it was war procurement. So you had both everything that was needed for the war and food. Then urbanization and the workshop of the world for the Victorian boom. They were exporting all over the place, but mainly urbanization created a whole middle class that benefited from that. Then we had the globalization infrastructure, which I mentioned before. So they were all building all these things all over the world to make sure that there was this global economy. Then we had suburbanization and the Cold War, uh, which, which created a whole direction of markets. I mean, can you imagine just home ownership by the workers. It meant a huge market that was guaranteed by unemployment insurance so that people could buy big items and pay them monthly. And then, what could the direction be now? Well, that's where I've come to the conclusion that it is smart green growth, which means sustainable production and lifestyles, which means basically that we reduce the amount of material and energy in GDP and in lifestyles. So we're talking about moving towards services, moving towards health, towards care, towards all creative activities, rather than consuming things. But the things would contain less material, they would be truly durable. I mean, it's such a joke to call durable goods durable, they're completely not durable. <laughs> so what we need, not only durable, but also to be able to rent them rather than buy them so that they can live 80, 100 years when I was young, 35 years for a refrigerator was nothing, it was normal. So, of course, with today's technology, we could do a lot. So rental means maintenance. We could have more maintenance workers in that whole industry than we had manufacturing workers in these countries, in those industries. So it makes a big difference and it can be done with government policy. 
but we also need full global development. Why do we need full global development? Because that would provide not only the humanitarian roles. I mean, obviously, that's the most important reason for full global development. But now we need it in order to have specialization in the world that will allow these countries to provide capital goods, engineering, high-tech things that are designed for uh, developing world conditions. So that full global development condition happens to be good for these countries, and it's very important that we manage to do something, maybe global taxes for global corporations or something, to fund that. So those are the things that make me think that the environment is not the problem, but the solution, and I hope you can agree to that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be in between uh, these two leaders, and I'll just add a few uh, reflections on my own. I, I think the, the basic point is that with the productivity and the knowledge and the skills that we have, and it's really nice when you walk up the street here that Richard Arkwright's uh, art Arkwright's uh, home is uh, right next door, and we're in a historic building that's been promoting uh, the wonders of uh, manufacturing and engineering for 250 years. With all that we have, we want to make sure that this is serving decent human purposes. And this is really the challenge of good economics. We know two things don't work and we're trying to find, uh, in a true Aristotelian way, the way in between the two things. Uh, one thing uh, that is sometimes said to work, and it was a, a famous idea that uh, started uh, here in Britain, uh, and there's a great deal of genius and merit to it, is the idea that an economy is self-organizing and uh, it's got an invisible hand that directs things to good outcomes. If you're lucky, if you sit at the top, if you put aside environmental disasters and many other things. But that's the self-organizing, uh, pure evolutionary vision of an economy. The other idea is the command and control that we know what we want to do, Communism is uh, Soviets plus electrification uh, in a phrase that is uh, 100 years old this year, I'm just realizing, uh, of Lenin. Uh, and um, that is the idea we just are going to go in that direction. Both of these approaches are uh, flawed, tragically flawed, in fact. Uh, the self-organizing idea we know is wrong because it fails in some very pertinent ways. It doesn't self-organize for the weakest people in society, doesn't help the poor, doesn't protect the poor from the rich, doesn't protect anybody from things that markets are not designed to address like climate change uh, or like the destruction of other species. Uh, it doesn't protect future generations from the current generation. So there are many, many reasons why uh, self-organization is an ingenious idea, but up to a point. The idea of command and control uh, also has merit, and there are cases where you really want to command and you want control, uh, and um, you can get something done quite quickly, and that's also very, very important. But we know that command and control by itself leads to first horrible decisions sometimes about where the command is going, uh, and it leads to excessive power. It can lead to uh, societies uh, killing their own in massive numbers, uh, as happened in the Soviet Union and uh, in Maoism and so on. Well, Aristotle just said everything right 2,300 years ago when he said the truth is always in the middle. Uh, and uh, avoid the extremes. Uh, and 
to be a free market economist is to close your eyes to really serious problems that the markets will never address or will exacerbate. And to believe in command and control is to have a faith uh, in our capacity to stop uh, uh, demons and, and tyrants uh, much more than we have. And believe me, these days I wish the U.S. government had no power at all, uh, and I'd feel a lot better uh, about life. So I felt very differently about it before, and I'll no doubt feel differently about it again, but uh, the idea of limited power, thanks God, um, that uh, we have uh, something like that as well. So I believe that every generation has to ask itself, what's important? Uh, where are we? Where do we steer? Where do we not steer so much? Uh, where do we need to head? And for our generation, we're in one way, ex of course, we're just uh, extraordinarily lucky to live at the apex of knowledge, uh, technological capacity, a brilliant uh, ongoing scientific and technological revolution around uh, information that really is about uh, almost 80 years old now. It started here, like so many things, with Alan Turing's incredible mind. Uh, and it uh, still continues to deliver. And Turing indeed said a Turing machine can uh, solve everything that can be put in zeros and ones. Uh, and he had that insight. And with good engineering, uh, it comes closer and closer to that. And capitalism, uh, in certain ways, has delivered magnificently in the last 40 years, not just for the top, but for reducing poverty uh, all over the world, especially in East Asia, where you had societies like China, which were almost entirely poor and now are almost entirely out of poverty. And I was with the Chinese foreign minister yesterday who reiterated China's commitment that by 2020, extreme poverty in China will be completely eliminated. And that's one of the great historical uh, achievements uh, in all of uh, economic uh, development. So we are the heirs of all of that. But we also know two big things about our own time. One is that through a combination of inadvertence bad luck of quantum physics, uh, greed, and un unbelievable stupidity, as marked by my president, uh, we face a really uh, existential struggle on climate change, uh, what Carlotto was talking about right now. It's been known, the basic dynamics of this, since Tyndall uh, around 1870 and since Fontarenius in 1896. Uh, made the estimates of what a doubling of CO2 would mean for the atmosphere. But coal, oil, and gas are just so great in things they can do uh, that we had another century of their massive use, and then they became the world's most powerful lobbies. And if you combine the greed with the foolishness of uh, people like Trump, you can go so far uh, to utter destruction. So that's, that's one thing we know. The second thing we know is that capitalism as a system, uh, again, everything starts here basically, uh, you know, is both incredibly productive but unbelievably violent as well. Remember that the first age of capitalism was the age of slave trade and, and uh, the capitalism of the sugar plantations uh, in the Caribbean. And capitalism does not look after uh, people that uh, President Trump calls the losers. Uh, and um, frankly, that's what morality is, is to look after people who are getting hurt by other people or who are left behind. That's not the opposite of what we want to do. That's precisely what we want to make sure is done. And there's nothing intrinsic in the market system for that purpose. So. I think our generation has these two uh, huge opportunities right now based on marvelous technology, incredible know-how, now a worldwide knowledge base that's not just restricted to the North Atlantic or to England and Glasgow or to uh, the United States or to Silicon Valley, but reaches across Asia. 
uh, with the great uh, engineering and invention uh, coming from more and more places, we have the chance to correct the environmental harms uh, and there's a lot of know-how in how to do that and a lot of directed technological change that could be made. And we also have the chance to be decent. Uh, and uh, decent means to make sure that uh, the world ends extreme poverty, that we don't leave people to die of Ebola, that we don't leave people to die of AIDS and uh, malaria. We wouldn't even have to break a sweat to accomplish those goals because it's not a lot of resources, it's not a lot of heroism, it's just basic attention. And interestingly, the, you know, even, even all these uh, leaders uh, are talking, oh, we have to direct resources, we have to direct resources, but what's the latest campaign? To make sure you're spending at least 2% of GDP on the military. <laughs> what kind of idiotic idea is this really? Uh, why don't they talk about making sure that uh, we're not going to have war, mm -hmm. that we're going to use diplomacy, and we're going to save that money to devote 2% of GDP to our future, our sustainability, safe environment, and so forth. Politicians, it's a weird group, by the way. <laughs> Just in general, their business is power. Our business should be well-being. That's quite a different thing. And while power has its uses, uh, it also corrupts, as uh, also was uh, first made known in these parts. And we need to control the politicians, and we need to guide the resources in the direction of human need. So one more uh, minute. Uh, the world almost unbelievably agreed on two really good big things at the end of 2015. One is the Sustainable Development Goals, where every one of the 193 UN member states said, we want economic development that is inclusive and sustainable. That's the definition that the UN gives. I call it smart, fair, and sustainable. We heard the trilogy from all of us. So, Every one of the 193 governments said, we want to achieve that, and they listed 17 goals for the year 2030. How much more directed can you be than that to say, let's make sure that by 2030, we can have extreme poverty ended, we can have the epidemic diseases controlled, we can uh, get emissions down, and so on. A few weeks after that, on December 12, 2015, the same 193 governments, plus three more signatories, the EU, Cook Islands and Nui, that's 196 members of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, signed the Paris Climate Agreement to say let's stay well below 2 degrees C warming because the scientists tell us if we reach 2 degrees C, we're already tipping the planet into something so profoundly dangerous it's reckless. So we have these agreements, we have the where to go, we have the experience that when you direct attention, good brains, good engineering, good resources, in the right ways, the results can be absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's our job to now implement what we have agreed to implement. Thank you. You were bang on. It was fabulous. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you. Um, <laughs> we only ran over, I think, by three minutes in total. So well done. Um, that was incredibly thought-provoking. Thank you all. And, and it was interesting, as you say, that there was um, a connection or connecting tissue between the three of you that was around this idea about smart and sustainable. And, and the way that you describe it is also inclusive or fair you know that it's not just the green challenge but the wider inequality issues featured widely in in all of your presentations i'm interested to to start the conversation and please do put your hands up because i'm going to there will be a roving mic so i'm going to come and collect some questions from the audience so get on your marks um, but to start off with a couple of questions and maybe starting with you mariana you know 
you've all taken us through this, this um, going beyond despair and into directionality. Let's, let's focus. Let's start thinking about how we do directional thinking. Um, and we have got some of the UK policy is moving towards some of this. There's a lot of um, discussion around inclusive growth. Um, there is a UK industrial strat strategy that is, is trying to point towards how we might have directions of travel. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts, Maria, and, and the rest of the panel, towards does current economic policy have the tools to focus on this kind of directionality? You know, you talked about intersectoral exploration, Mariana, and I think that that's a, that's a challenge to the industrial strategy, which may focus more on sectors and, and more traditional ways. So how might we, you know, bridge, what did you call it, the turning point into this golden age through thinking about missions? How do we move from sectors to missions? Well, I think one important point is also that even when we don't have a direction, that itself is a direction, right? The word deregulation, for example, is a false word. That's a choice, <laughs> right? So this kind of deliberative act, the real question I think that we're trying to raise is what kind of de uh, deliberation, what kind of missions, right? Because even war is a mission, right? Now, the UK currently is, in fact, embarking, uh, and this is the one good thing, the only good thing, I guess, about Brexit was we got rid of a pretty problematic uh, Eton crowd in government and Theresa May you know, comes in and actually talks about you know, inclusive growth, corporate governance, industrial strategy, but again, as I said before, it fell back quite quickly into a list of sectors. And concretely, what we could do is actually look around the world, as I was saying, because there's lots of lessons out there on what it meant to actually have innovation policies and industrial strategies led by these kind of challenges. So Germany today, you know, Germany is not the, the perfect place. We know there's lots of problems in Germany, but one particular lesson today that we can learn from Germany is its energy vend policy, which is not just about renewable energy. It has actually stimulated new thinking across all its sectors, including, you know, steel, which we all like to think is of sort of boring old economy sector. In fact, what steel has had to do out of the pressure from energy vent, because missions create pressures um, for of, you know, new deals, as I was saying, was to lower its material content. So repurpose, reuse, and recycle. That's what the German steel industry does. The German steel industry here does not. And just lastly, this whole question of deals, I could not sort of highlight that word more. We need new contracts. We need new mechanism design, a la you know, Eric Maskin. And why do I say that? Because in fact, Carlotte, I think one thing that was missing, even though I know you agree with me, of your presentation was that the reason that you had this process of creative destruction in the past, where you had big innovations which could take away some jobs, but then there was a renewal process, was also because profits were being reinvested back into the economy. Today, we're living through an extreme period of financialization and of hoarding. So two trillion euros in Europe being hoarded, uh, two trillion dollars in the US being hoarded, and extreme financialization, so profits being used simply to do things like buy back shares, which boost stock options, which boost executive pay. That's because we don't have a deal. So one of the most innovative private R&D laboratories in the past, which actually you know, co-got us the IT revolution, was called Bell Labs. Bell Labs did not come out of you know, nowhere. It wasn't AT&T that just woke up and said, mm, let's do some innovation. They were forced to. They were a monopoly. That's a deal. What does the government get back from that at the time? It was reinvestment. And they were asked to reinvest AT&T's profits back into the real economy, back into innovation, back into big innovation beyond telecoms. Today, we don't have that, for example, with the energy companies. And Exxon is extremely financialized, but so is Microsoft, so is Cisco, and so is Pfizer, right? And that's you know, getting public and private, not just to co-invest in these big challenges, but also to really see the value that they're creating as co-created would put more pressure in terms of the right kinds of contracts that we should have in order to get this inclusive growth. This has to be in business as well as in government. Absolutely. Um, Carlotta, you had talked about a quantum leap in technology that's, that's required. So what is the kind of clear direction or the state's role in fueling this new technology revolution that you talked about? Um, well, the quantum leap in technology happens because of the technological revolution. That isn't exactly what you have to push. What you have to push is how to gear that technological revolution, that possibility of that quantum leap in a particular direction, which will provide convergence for everybody. So uh, how do you do that? I mean, there are hundreds of policies that could be invented by imaginative people. 
I can invent a crazy one and we'd have to study whether, it, whether it's possible. For instance, VAT is a tax on salaries and profits. How about flipping that tax and making it a tax on materials, energy and transport? It would change radically the economics of almost every innovation that's being done. The direction of innovation would go into reducing material content and maybe not worrying so much about jobs, by the way. Payroll taxes are mad. Payroll taxes are a disincentive to employ people. And you know why? Because during mass production, it was important to have very high salaries so that people would buy a lot. Of course, the whole of consumerism was based on that. The third world let them starve. But the developed world, the advanced world, had very high salaries so that people could buy a lot, but also so that employers would increase productivity by reducing labor because it was expensive. So it's an odd sort of policy which actually managed what I just showed you also. So um, the whole idea of having a policy that taxes what we want, which is jobs, is mad. The same thing with the welfare state the way we have it now. What do we have? We have a welfare state that assumes that people have lifetime jobs, that assumes that you're only going to be unemployed for two, for two or three months, that assumes that there are no zero-hours contracts, that assumes that very few people are self-employed, and the only ones that are self-employed are people who are rich and have businesses, you know, not, not what we now have, which is a lot of people doing Uber or something else, self-employed. So we've got to think of something else. So, so basic income is something we've got to think about because it fits this revolution. So I told you social political changes, techno-economic changes, policy changes. We've got to think outside the box, but really outside the box. We've got to judge every single policy we have as to whether it was designed for mass production and mass consumption or whether it's capable of facing the new reality, which is variety, differentiation, uh, all sorts of things which are so different, and also the need not to discriminate the developing world. So we need also to think in terms of a global economy that's going to give everybody the possibility of, of having a good life, and certainly not going backward like we are going in the advanced world, going backward from what people used to have or hope for for their children, that is suicidal. And I always say that austerity is actually austericide, and we should really understand how dangerous that policy is and how much it's responsible for all the problems we have with Trump and Le Pen and all the others. Mm -hmm. There you go, talking point. Um, I think... You had talked about future generations and very much what you're talking about there is innovation for future generations rather than innovation based on past performance. Um, you, you ended with the sustainable development goals, Jeff, and those do give a direction. There's clear directionality within that. But you also talked about this tension between the, t the, t the binary between the invisible hand versus command and control and that the truth will out in the middle. Can you give us a bit more about what that middle looks like so we can get going on that innovation? I want to speak against jobs for one moment, though, because uh, I'm not, uh, I, I think, again, the key is an economy that produces well-being. So I want to, how many people here are at work right now? Yeah, okay, good. I'm at work also. What, is this work? No, this is wonderful. It's a pleasure. I, I hope for you, for me it is. Uh, but this is, uh, we're, I hope, enjoying uh, hearing each other, uh, listening. Uh, it's incredibly pleasant. We're not breaking a sweat. Um, and and uh, to my mind, that is part of what uh, is uh, possible in a really smart economy. Why is this? I, I'll tell you who's really working right now hard is the robots on the uh, assembly line floor right now that are putting out the vehicles, the planes, uh, pieces that got me here, and so forth. So part of what the 
uh, technological revolution makes possible is that we are able to devote more and more of our time, we call it work if we're privileged, uh, but we should face this. This is a kind of leisure uh, that we get paid for. Uh, and we should make sure that the benefits of this kind of life can be shared very widely. Uh, a lot of the planet works in back-breaking labor, real work. Uh, and if you spend a day in an African village, uh, women are bent over all day in the field, and they're collecting water. It's hard. It hurts. It hurts. Physically hurts. So uh, what we call work isn't work, to my mind. Uh, it's... Uh, without physical duress, it's in pleasant environment. Often it's in a coffee shop, another great invention uh, of uh, the modern yeah, world. Uh, and um, I don't think we should define our endpoint as work in the traditional sense. We should define our endpoint as a good quality of life that is widely shared. Uh, what has happened in the US, I can tell you in, in the data right now, the average work time for an American over the age of 16 on any given day, any guesses? Average number of hours of a 16 and older for the whole population. It's about three hours, 10 minutes now. And three hours, 10 minutes of 16 and over supports a productive economy that's nearly $60,000 per person per year. That's a wonderful success. I bet it'll be two hours uh, on average in 20 years or 30 years from now because the machines do more, because the more people will be studying or learning creative skills or doing other things, more retirees because of an aging population. That's what's showing up in the data, more vacation time uh, so that people uh, are not working uh, as many hours per year. And that's all for... Uh, for the benefit. So how to get there? That's what you really asked me. Uh, but that's where I think we should think about where we're going, uh, not uh, how many jobs and how many sectors per se, but how to be fair, uh, how to give a high quality of life for seven and a half billion people, by the way. That's mass production. In order to do, have everybody on this planet well-fed, safe water, access to health care, uh, and so forth, you need mass, mass, mass. And so this is another part. We're living in a world of systems that have to be super sophisticated, much more sophisticated than we are as individuals because we have seven and a half billion people. Every day they need safe water. Every single day, every few hours they need safe water. Uh, every, they need safety from epidemic diseases. People want a good life. They want the same thing, that they can sit and listen to a talk or give a talk and have that pleasure rather than being in backbreaking labor. So this is a lot about systems deployment of technologies. There isn't one single answer to the question. It's too complicated. But what I can say is that sometimes when a technology is mature, uh, as Carlota says, and the issue is deployment, then command and control makes a lot of sense often for a lot of things. I'm into command and control deployment of anti-malaria bed nets, for example, so that we can stop malaria. I'm in, I'm in favor of command and control deployment of antiretroviral medicines. Do I want a market for me antiretroviral medicines? No, I want the AIDS epidemic to be brought to zero. So there's certain classifications of things that really are susceptible to move the resources to make sure that people that need them get done. And then there are other things where you really do want the Steve Jobs uh, with his uh, zany, zany uniqueness to be creating things that no bureaucracy could ever create. And then at times you need, you need things like the Manhattan Project perhaps, which is another command and control case of uh, we want a bomb, atomic bomb, before Germany gets one. And you put the best minds in, in the country together in Los Alamos, <coughs> New Mexico, and within a couple of years, you've created a, 
scientific miracle, and for the rest of uh, humanity, now we have to make sure it never gets used again. Um, but these are, economics cannot be unfortunately summarized in a few uh, sound bites, except to say that there are times when you want to do it one way, there are times when you want to do it another way, and we should have lots of rich discussions like this Absolutely. to identify which is which. The complexity is in the system. Um, over to you. I'm going to take three questions. So there's one at the back there, there's another at the back there, and there's one at the front. So if I'm, I'm, I'm going to take them in a group. Um, so go ahead, sir. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Gavin Starks. Uh, I've been building mission-driven companies for the last 15 years, uh, most recently the Open Data Institute. Um, my question is, if I'm going to build something new this year, what problem would you like to see solved in 2017 that nice helps question. us move this forward? Okay. Gentleman at the back, the other gentleman. Hello, uh, Nathaniel Mason, I'm a research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute. Um, implicit across the three talks, I thought was a, um, a theme around the fact that innovation, whether it's mission-driven or emergent, is going to create winners and losers. Uh, that being the case, uh, could we do better to anticipate what the current winners and potential losers might do to obstruct positive innovations as they emerge? Okay. And gentlemen there, there should be is a mic running towards you as we speak. Do you want to raise your hand so they know where to get it? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Clancy. I'm interested in housing. Um, I would like the UK to have, and this is, hopefully this is outside of the box enough for you. Um, I would like the UK to have the most sustainable, the most affordable, and the most architecturally beautiful housing in the world, um, who do we talk about making that happen to? I like how you did the little try, the, the three words in the same way that all of our panellists have. So sustainable, affordable and beautiful. Have we got a lady in the audience? We have Twitter and, and another. Yeah, let's, let's run it through. We'll do lady here and then one from Twitter. Thank you very much. I thought that was a brilliant panel. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask mainly Mariana. She talked about the first question of a very exciting project. Um, you're a very exciting project. What, how should specific organizations move forward? Which I think is excellent. What if you don't have those specific organizations? Like, for example, in the case of the UK, you don't have a public development bank. How do you create it in this particular context? And, and how do you override the political economy um, obstacles to creating it in, in a financial sector so dominated by the city? And also, if you're in the context, as Carlota said, of austericide, where everything is apparently so constrained by resources, although, of course, it's not really constrained, but in the perception. Thank you. The perception of austericide. And our final question, because we're going to have five now. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Um, one final question from Twitter. Um, what role does labour organisation play in driving growth and securing deployment benefits? What role do labour organisations yeah. play? I'm guessing, yeah. Uh, in driving growth. Okay, so we have, um, if you were to build a mission this year, what problem would you like to solve? Um, and then we're going to look at housing and um, the issue around innovation creating winners and losers. So let's start with the, the problem this year. Where would you focus? Should we just give snappy answers? Snappy answers. Yeah. Well, my snappy one would be, uh, there's, you know, everyone talks about big data, but it's striking how much it's mainly been used for areas where there's very clear sort of profit opportunities. So personalized medicine has been an area where it's really been used. And we have very simple al algorithms instead, so the opposite of big data, right? Little basic arithmetic being used for the welfare state. So if, if you think of the uh, bedroom tax, right? This amount of kids, this amount of bedrooms, one is bigger than the other, you're out, right? So how could we actually use big data to enrich the lives of those people that we actually have data on? Poor people. We have lots and lots of data on them. Uh, we have very little data, as we know from uh, uh, the re recent events, on what, you know, what's happening to the money of very rich people. So how can we use big data to enrich and reform the welfare state? The welfare state has to in absolutely undergo the kinds of institutional changes that Carlota Perez's work absolutely highlights. 
but we still need a welfare state. Let's believe in it, let's enrich it, and let's actually direct big data analysis to actually create the kind of complex, the complexity, uh, but enriching complexity of the lives of the people who need it the most. So we're running slightly over time, so problem this year. I, I would uh, advise, uh, take a look at, uh, at the 17 sustainable development goals and choose one of them. Uh, and um, to my mind, goals like universal access to quality education or universal access to health care are really susceptible of major advances using information technology. And uh, right now, about 15% of uh, African kids finish high school. The goal was that it should be 100% by 2030. I think that's overwhelmingly a technology challenge, actually, uh, how to ramp up tremendously the ability to teach, to reach with the quality curriculum, uh, to train teachers in uh, 13 years. Uh, so that, I think, is an exciting both market and technological uh, possibility where there's a lot of interest, but the breakthroughs need to be made. You could say the same about healthcare, given all the things that now can be done on monitoring, measuring, uh, using smart uh, technologies. But from my point of view, take any one of the 17 mm. and say, I've got something good to add to that. Policy, could you, could you pick a problem no. and address the housing no. question no. at the same time, oh, do you reckon? Oh, God, no, not <laughs> the, that, that's a big one. No, no, I would just want taxes to be changed in such a way that short-term investment, minutes, seconds, sorry, microseconds, seconds, da, 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 up to one day, you pay 90% on whatever capital gains you make. One year, 50%. Two years, 30%. Five years, zero. So if you change that, you could start moving finance in a different way than this casino we have. If we don't change that, we're never going to get the thing going. And by the way, and people think this is impossible, but we should remember that when NASA was founded, and that's you know, the most kind of archetypical mission-oriented organization, the president at the time was a Republican, Eisenhower, military general. What was the top marginal taxation rate? Over 90%. Just to say, there has been big thinking around taxation over the history of capitalism. And what's very interesting is how tax has often been a result of the stories we tell. And think of Plato's whole point, which is storytellers rule the world. The stories we tell of where wealth creation comes from has actually created quite a regressive taxation system. Which could potentially answer the question of how do we create new, new organizations that fill a vacuum that's not there by using new stories. I am going to have to, to, um, to close up now as a result of us actually most of the people in the audience being at work and so having to go back to work. Um, <laughs> And I could be here all day with you three because it's been absolutely inspirational. But um, I'd like to uh, guide you. There are some uh, leaflets outside if you want to pick up to find out more about the mission oriented innovation policy work. Um, but it just leaves time to say thank you to our amazing panellists, Jeff, Carlotta and Mariana. Thank you.